Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are at. Very warm welcome from Florida International University. My name is Atarud Azizi Namini, director of the ABC UTC at Florida International University. Um, before the start of the webinar, just a couple of news uh, we did share with you. Uh, we are delighted to let you know that uh, our proposal uh, called the IBT slash ABCUTC was funded by the USDOT, was selected by USDOT to continue from 2023 to 2029. Uh, this time around, in addition to taking the ABC and developing the next generation of the ABC, we're also going to focus on bringing the innovative concept to the bridge engineering. So these are all the new advanced technology to make sure that the bridge engineering in the US is absolutely is number one in the world. One of the projects that we are going to be undertaking is development of the next generation of the asset management system. This is uh, not going to happen overnight. We are hoping uh, within the life of this uh, IBT slash ABC UTC, we will take you to the point that we can implement it in the field. And in that sense, all our projects have a research advisory panel. If you are interested in being a member of the research advisory panel for this project, please, by all means, send me an email at aazizi na at fiu.edu. Uh, well, we have already received some uh, uh, interest, but uh, one of the criteria for being a member of the research advisory panel for this particular project is that within your organization, you need to have some significant responsibility in asset management system. The idea is that to really to have a uh, good input in the process, and we want to carry this particular project in conjunction with the industry and the bridge owners. Our presentation today features the Michigan Department of Transportation's 2nd Avenue Bridge over I-94 project in Detroit, completed last year. We're pleased to welcome our presenters, Mike Lavalette, National Bridge Practice Leader with HDR, Matt Longfield, Michigan Bridge Section Leader with HDR, and John Belger, Bridge Construction Engineer with the Michigan Department of Transportation. Also, we'd like to introduce our Q&A session moderators, Rick Liptek, Chief Bridge Construction Engineer with the Michigan Department of Transportation, and Paul Lyles, formerly Georgia State Bridge Engineer, both members of our ABC UTC Advisory Committee. We'll now begin the featured presentation. Mike? Hi, everybody. So as you've heard, we're, we're here to talk about a really interesting uh, project that we just finished in Detroit last year, the I-94 Second Avenue Bridge. Uh, this is really a unique combination of different ABC technologies. In fact, we've got two ABC technologies in the same project, so I assume we get twice as much time to talk about it on the webinar today. Um, just a little quick agenda for the presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the site constraints and the bridge design. Uh, Matt Longfield is going to speak about the variety of ABC alternatives that we looked at uh, before we converged onto the final solution and some of the construction engineering that went into uh, a, a project like this. And then John Belcher is going to lead us through the bridge move step by step with a series of photos and time lapse video and that type of thing. We should have plenty of time left at the end for question and answer. So just a couple photos of the rest of us. Um, you know, as John and I are busy on the site and we don't actually have a photo of Matt on the site actually doing any work. So we had to show a generic photo of him. Uh, actually, he was the one that was probably working harder than all of us. He was actually taking most of the photos as the project happened. A little bit of introduction in, on the various sites. Uh, this project is part of the I-94 uh, reconstruction of a, a section through urban downtown Detroit. Uh, the plan of the advanced bridges program is to replace a number of bridges that are in relatively poor condition prior to a full corridor reconstruction in the next few years. 
Uh, one of the things MDOT was very interested in when we started this was looking at a variety of different ABC methods that might be appropriate uh, for the sites. Uh, and because this was a roughly $2 billion project, they really wanted some type of a signature structure to sort of be the, the aesthetic highlight uh, to bring attention to the overall project. So I think we uh, met that goal very well in the end. In terms of specifically the Second Avenue Bridge, uh, and really with any ABC project, we're always trying to minimize traffic impacts, both to the city street and in this case, to the freeway down below. I-94 carries about 175,000 vehicles a day through this stretch. So it's, it's just a, a huge problem uh, with traffic backups on a normal day. So anything we could do to minimize that was important. The other thought uh, MDOT had in mind was to minimize any throwaway work, uh, trying to be as efficient as possible. So we looked at a number of conventional bridge alternatives uh, as well. The plan for this I-94 corridor is to eventually widen the entire corridor and shift the center line alignment about 40 feet to the north. So anything we would do with a conventional bridge would require some type of a pier in the median as it stands today, as well as a new median pier at some point in the future. So that really sort of eliminated the idea of a conventional bridge solution. Uh, the other thing that's important here at this site, uh, this is right next to the Wayne State University campus, and you'll see that here on one of the coming slides. So it, it's a very heavily student trafficked area, lots of students on foot, on bikes, and that sort of thing. So it was really important to make it as friendly as possible uh, for all forms of transportation. The city and MDOT also wanted this bridge to be not only aesthetically pleasing, but to provide some green space right in the middle of the city. So we've got plantings, both in the raised median as well as in planter boxes and, and lighting as well. You know, with a signature bridge like this, you certainly want aesthetic lighting to highlight some of the structural elements but it's also important that people feel safe walking across the bridge at all hours of the day and night. So functional lighting is also an important consideration. So I talked a little bit about why an, a long span solution or a clear span solution made sense and why we wanted to eliminate the center pier. Um, the fact that they're widening the bridge in the future, the freeway in the future, um, we wanted to make sure that the, the design and the future construction had plenty of room to work, so they weren't working around any obstacles at ground level. Uh, and the fact that we've got a great separation bridge, we wanted to minimize any profile grade raise on I-94 because of local businesses. Um, so we wanted a shallow structure, as shallow as we could possibly come up with. So that, that's where an arch makes an awful lot of sense. And then obviously the use of SPMTs are launching uh, is a great solution for a site like this. So that was certainly an important thought as well. So looking at an aerial view of the site, you can see Wayne State University on the lower right-hand corner. I-94 running more or less east and west through the project area. You can see the, the red rectangle indicates where the bridge will be located. And we're right adjacent to another very, very busy freeway, Michigan Highway 10, just to the west of our project. And you can see why with the roadway flaring, uh, going westbound on I-94, having additional space beneath the bridge for a future widening is gonna be really important. One of the other constraints we had to work around is a historic building on the Northeast corner of our site. Uh, that's United Sound Studios is a historic recording studio that was really the beginnings of Motown music, one of Detroit's true cultural icons. And so we wanted to do everything we could to avoid touching that building, both during design in terms of selecting an alignment, as well as during construction. Looking at the I-94 corridor, this is looking eastbound. A couple of things to point out. Well, go back just one slide. The only place we really had room to assemble the bridge for a contractor to have working space is in this staging area just to the west of the bridge site. If you look at the view from the roadway, that staging area is up at the top of the grade to the right. So we've got about a 20 foot grade difference between the staging area and I-94. We've also got a three to four foot grade difference between eastbound and westbound I-94 separated by uh, concrete barriers with infill material. 
Uh, so any type of uh, system to move the bridge across I-94 had to accommodate that great difference. And you'll also notice the vertical clearance sign on the previous bridge. All of the bridges through this corridor have a, a rather low vertical clearance. And so we wanted to uh, anticipate the potential for overheight vehicle strikes. So we wanted some type of a structure that was going to be redundant and repairable in the event of a vehicle strike somewhere in the future. We're looking at a rendering of the bridge that was prepared during design. Uh, you can see it, it looks a little bit too long for the site. Oh, on the right-hand side, which is the north side of I-94, it looks like the bridge is just plain too big. But the fact is that's that 40-foot future widening, and we wanted to accommodate all of that in the layout of the bridge. Uh, one of the advantages the site has is a really very accessible detour uh, that kind of shaded or cross-hatched area at the top of the screen is I-94 and the red rectangle is the bridge. You see we've got a, about a four-mile detour available. That's all freeway. It's a very simple detour uh, for any closure period. So that made it certainly a lot more attractive for some type of a short-term closure. Uh, the bridge design itself is a 245-foot span network tied arch. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, a network tied arch is different than a more traditional arch with vertical hangers. You see the, the hanger cables are inclined and uh, cross each other, and that provides a number of advantages uh, in terms of structural performance. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Uh, the bridge is 96 feet wide out to out. So it, it becomes a, a very, um, a bridge that gives us an awful lot of space to provide that separation for pedestrians uh, and vehicle traffic. Uh, a couple of the interesting challenges with this site, the, the bridge is skewed about 18 degrees right ahead, um, primarily to miss that historic building to accommodate frontage road alignments and things like that. It's also got an asymmetric vertical curve. Uh, and normally that's not a big challenge for a bridge designer. We do these types of things all the time. Uh, that becomes a little bit of a different story when you're talking about a tied arch bridge or something that's not conventional. Um, in our case, because of the vertical curve, because of the skew, every single one of the steel floor beams, and you can see the kind of bat wing configuration over to the right, has to be a little bit different. So that creates a little bit of fabrication and assembly challenge for the contractor. It also creates a fair number of analysis and detailing challenges during the design phase. Uh, in terms of ABC construction, and, and really we were planning on some type of ABC from the very beginning of this project. Where this becomes complicated is when you've got this, the, between the skew and the vertical curve, now all four corners of the bridge and their associated bearing elevations are somewhat different so all four corners are different so anything that's that has to do with moving the bridge launching the bridge or sliding it you have to account for that elevation difference at all times uh, and obviously uh, aesthetics is, is a hugely important part of this project one of the things uh, we were concerned with this skewed bridge was the potential of adding lateral bracing between the arch ribs that's sort of a traditional way of doing this the problem is when you do that with, especially with a wide arch bridge like this, it gives the structure almost a warped appearance, and we really wanted to avoid that. So that really drove all of the thinking behind an unbraced arch system. So in the final condition, our bridge has no lateral bracing between the ribs. Just to give you a sense of how big the bridge is, we've overlaid the framing plan on a football field. So 245 foot span nearly 100 feet wide, and in the end, it weighs about 5.2 million pounds. And so we're talking about picking this entire thing up and moving it into place over a very busy freeway. So certainly lots and lots of challenges. Uh, I talked a minute ago about some of the advantages of a network tied arch and, and why that's important compared to a more traditional tied arch structure. It, it, it's just playing a more efficient system. Uh, the fact that the incline hangers reduce the arch rib moment and shear forces considerably, and you can see in the, the diagrams down below, these two uh, examples are identical, except for the difference between the hanger systems. 
and you see the member forces in the arch rib are reduced by a factor of what three and a half so it allows us to make a more efficient structure more slender and attractive structure in the end uh, saving materials saving weight for the move so there's lots of advantages to the network hanger system it also makes for a much stiffer and more redundant structure in the end so so many advantages and that's why we've seen the growth in the use of network tied arch bridges across the u.s uh, in the last 10 or 15 years it's not a new system it was enveloped in norway back in the 50s so this is not something new but it's definitely taken hold in the u.s and we're seeing this more and more often uh, looking at some of the structure details here's a just a view of the arch rib uh, prior to erection uh, you see it's a trapezoidal box girder section uh, that was driven primarily by uh, the unbraced nature of the system, um, all welded. And you can see the hangers are uh, connected to an internally welded, while it's, it's a welded member uh, inside of the arch rib, and the hanger plates project through slots in the bottom flange of the arch. So then the hangers are connected uh, to those in a second. Uh, hanger cables, three and an eighth inch, uh, A586 structural strand, um, all galvanized for corrosion protection. Uh, one of the things that's a common problem on arch bridges are the really, really short hangers at the ends of the bridge. You can see in that middle photo how short that endmost hanger is. So there's almost no cable at all. So any adjustments at all to the hanger length greatly changes the forces in the hanger as well. The way the hangers are adjusted in our design is with a stack of shim plates at the very bottom between the casting that's part of the hanger and the hanger connection uh, at the end of the floor beam. So adding or subtracting one of those galvanized shim plates is how they were changing and adjusting the hanger forces. So like I said, any, you know, even a sixteenth of an inch change in the shim plate thickness really does change the hanger forces. Um, the structure combines both a steel arch rib and floor beams with a post-tension concrete system for the tie girders and end diaphragms. Um, and that was really done for redundancy. That was one of the very first meetings we had during the design phase. MDOT was, was very positive about ha having a post-tension tie girder system to make it internally redundant, also make it repairable in the event of, of collisions with overheight vehicles in the future. So we've got 8,000, or excuse me, 8 KSI concrete for the tie girders with 12, 19 strand tendons. The end diaphragms, uh, also some high strength concrete of six and a half KSI with the uh, uh, 19 strand tendons as well. Uh, this is not really what you'd call uh, self-consolidating concrete. It's, it's almost self-consolidating, but certainly we wanted to make it as flowable as possible. Uh, to fit around the, the rebar and the post-tensioning hardware in the knuckle region. And then the arch ribs are post-tensioned down to the knuckle with inch and three-eighths dewey dag rods. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Matt Longfield. He's going to talk about some of the construction considerations that are part of the design. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um... So kind of really to kick off the construction engineering, we almost have to kind of step back to the design a little bit and just some of the abc alternatives that were considered and and what went into you know uh looking at what a contractor may do and how they may want to build this bridge so we, knowing we had to build in you know next to the bridge and the staging area and then move it we really looked at kind of three three main options one was assembling the the full superstructure uh, this would be your deck your barriers uh they actually had some planter boxes and other things that are getting put on the final structure as well and then picking that up and moving it into place. Be the most complete, most amount of work done off, you know, away from I-94, however, the most weight to move. The second option was really paring that back down to just the skeleton. So no deck, uh, just the um, tie, arch, tie girder, and diaphragm and floor beams, and moving that into place. Then the third option was more of a kind of a precast way of looking at it, where you'd have arch rib panel sections of a tie girder and the arch rib, and then bringing in precast sections for the floor beams and the rest of it. Uh, what we ended up deciding on was the kind of that paired back option, where you bring build a bridge skeleton off site, and then you can build your abutments uh, in place up the I against I-94 with shoulder closures. And really, what drove this was was the weight. 
uh, ended up being about 5.3 million pounds just for this. <laughs> Um, and really was pushing the SBMTs to their limit for what they could do uh, within the site and the constraints, as well as um, just limiting stresses that would be imparted on the structure during the move. So, and being design engineers, you know, we realize that we may not know everything about how a heavy mover may want to do this project, especially given just the unique nature of it. So during the design phase, there was a series of meetings with all the different heavy movers that you see on the screen. These were confidential, and it was really just to ask them, how would you go about doing this so we could come up with a suggested erection sequence in the plans that at least two of these heavy movers could do, just to keep the bids competitive. Uh, I should also mention this project was done in a design bid build uh, procurement. So once after these meetings, we were able to come up with a, a suggested sequence, which is used as our basis of design, really to help uh, estimate those locked in stresses or just even temporary stresses the structure may see during the construction. So what came out of that um, was, we call this a handbag configuration. Uh, if you can see my mouse here, I'm gonna point a little bit with that. Where lifting frames would be set on top of SPMTs. This would be in the parking lot uh, or that staging area there next to I-94. Uh, the inbound of the knuckles, you would lift up the arch drive it over to I-94 down here in the bottom section of the screen, where at that point, it would be handed off uh, to SPMTs on I-94 down below with some towers, at which point it could drive the rest of the wheel across before setting it down on the abutments. Um, now, in this con this configuration of lifting the structure, again, weight was, was critical, um, just the different stresses that it was putting uh, into the bridge. So temporary end diaphragms were detailed uh, that were steel instead of the composed engine concrete for this, again, keeping the weight down. And it really did kind of drive a lot of the permanent structure geometry that we came up with, really trying to minimize the member sizes, uh, really just uh, reduce the weight. Of course, knowing that any of the contractors we had talked to or the heavy movers could do this um, if they won the job, there's a very detailed special provision that was developed requiring the contractor to furnish their own analysis and erection plans that was consistent with their own means and methods. And they did. And it really wasn't too terribly different, you know, than uh, what we had in the plans, but there were some, were some very key differences though. Uh, really, the biggest one was they did not use that handbag configuration, and they picked up the knuckles, uh, I'm sorry, they picked up the bridge right under the knuckles where the permanent bearings are, um, which from structurally speaking, this is great. The bridge is designed to be supported in this condition. Uh, it allowed those end diaphragms to get poured in that staging area and not next to I-94 and reduce the traffic impacts even further. Now, the complication here is we... The, there was a handoff once the SPMTs got up to I-94. Well, the way it was being handed off, you've now blocked uh, with how you're currently picking it. Um, there's you know equipment in the way. So how do you how do you handle this? And this is the key difference here. So if you can see in this picture, it's a little hard to see. Although I promise we have lots more pictures of this as the presentation goes on. This is a skidding shoe right here from Mamu, uh, who uh, was selected for the job, and <clears throat> What they did was uh, drove the bridge over to I up to the freeway, then put the bridge onto a skid track, slid it on the skid track over the abutments, and then onto the towers with uh, supported on SPMTs down I-94 below, and then were able to drive it the rest of the way across. And then one final slide back over top to the abutments. So that we'll be able to show this better later as we go in the presentation. Um, for those keeping track of um, ABC style points at home, again, as Mike mentioned earlier, we did an SPMT move and a slide. Uh, one other fun fact to mention here is the erection plans for this sequence uh, and calc supporting calculations was over 1,700 pages. And this was not a lot of computer output that you can generate easily. This was a very pared down version um, and every one of those sheets needed to be looked at. Um, now, how do we do that? Uh, well, it wasn't just one person is the short answer. It took a lot, a whole team effort to do this. Um, HDR uh, was the engineer of record for the superstructure. 
I was reviewing it. Uh, MDOT had a lot of their own construction staff as well as some material staff uh, working on the project. And I'll also give a shout out to Parsons. I was brought in as an independent peer review. They did a great job, were very valuable to the team. And we all worked together uh, with the contractor's erection engineer, who in this case was Jansen and Spons. I'll give a shout out to them as well. Um, and it really, it took every one of us on this team to review everything, think through all the steps, what could go wrong, what may go wrong, and maybe didn't happen, uh, but to really just reduce that risk. And honestly, this is really a highlight of the whole project is how well everyone worked together and the, the project would not have been successful without it. We're gonna hit that point a few times in this presentation. Um, so as part of that review, uh, you know, again, we're engineers, we like to crunch numbers, we like to build models, so we, we did. And we ended up having three different full finite element models of the superstructure. Um, the erection engineer had theirs, because with their analysis, HDR, we, we took our model from the design phase and updated it for the contractor's erection sequence, and then Parsons uh, made one for themselves. And we held regularly scheduled meetings for about a year um, every few weeks just to check in, see the progress, uh, just discuss modeling techniques and scenarios and, and how one might go about it. I mean, you know, the knuckles was a kind of, was a great example of, did you do one massive concrete element or did you do smaller concrete elements connected by rigid links and how much load is being taken by those really stiff knuckle elements and how did it impact the forces in that short hanger right adjacent to it? Or such things as where did you put the imperfection in the, in the arch to get it to buckle? Um, Again, not only is necessarily right, wrong, otherwise, but just you know, slightly different how we may all want to do things. And again, lot, lots of great discussion, a highlight of my career, I'd say. And we did not move forward until we had uh, concurrence between all three models that, ever, that the procedure was going to work. Also, being engineers, we like to be planners usually too. And we developed a very detailed bridge move document, completely separate from that other erection plan. Um, detailing out every step that you could think of that would happen during this move. And this this was critical. It forced everyone to think about how it would go. Um, had schedule, safety procedures, who to call, their phone numbers, all the equipment, spare parts. Obviously, there's was more calculations for the SPMTs in there. A monitoring plan, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, and we actually had everyone uh, meet in Detroit about a month prior to the move, spend a whole day, just talking through step by step how things were going to go. And it was all very beneficial to keep everyone on the same page like this. Uh, one thing you know, I do like to mention here too, talking about you know, accel the accelerated bridge construction techniques was very early on, um, we did have a, a VECP uh, concept that was submitted by the contractor. And ultimately it was not accepted, but it required a substantial redesign um, However, it was some really great outside the box thinking, which you absolutely need for a project like this. And it was to build the bridge in place over the freeway in about a week long closure, which is what we had for the move, uh, but use precast tie girder segments and use the post tensioning to splice them together. So again, it ultimately was not accepted due to the substantial redesign. However, some great outside the box thinking. So it's definitely worth mentioning. So I did make a promise about the monitoring plan um, and we had a very robust one on this. We used the ro robotic total station um, to shoot relative distances between the nodes you can see on the screen as well as the set of electrified wires that provided continuous monitoring. Now it was decided even the design and uh, still even in construction, we all agree that the worst possible thing that could happen to this bridge was for one of the uh, corners to go out of plane and twist the superstructure relative to the rest of it. Now this could be to uh, an SPMT losing hydraulic pressure in one corner settling, or you go over a large bump and that you know, corner goes up. Um, so based on this, uh, we were able to set those electrified wires at a specific gap. So if that um, settlement or out of plane movement, I'm sorry, did occur, they would touch, a light would go off and people would be able to see right then and there that the bridge was in a bad spot and to stop and make an adjustment. Uh, we established limits based off this, um, kind of, a, I think of it like a green light, yellow light, red light. So three inches was our red light full out stop, two inches was our yellow light to stop and make an adjustment. And really the erection engineer was on site during the move and he was, more or less was best pals with the one doing the uh, 
uh, watching the numbers on the monitoring system the rest of the time. So with that, I'm going to kick this over to John Belcher from MDOT to take it from here. All right, so I'm going to keep you kind of focused as this is an ABC webinar. I'm going to focus on the actual move itself and avoid all of the construction that uh, caused me to use up all of my uh, employer's benefits for mental health. Uh, we're going to focus on, like I said, on the move starting in July 6th and 7th. Uh, these are the three gentlemen that did the yeoman's work of the kind of the cable tensioning and the things we had to do to kind of wrap up and prepare for the move. And if anyone was wondering how you get a 1 16th inch shim, to fit on all the, with all these heavy components, uh, Diego there on the right is showing you the precision tool that we utilized. So uh, July 6th through the 8th is we're getting our final prep. The, con the contractor had said that the heavy mover had 77 semi loads that were gonna be strategically arriving over a three, four day period. Uh, and uh, you know that we'd be a very stra uh, str strategic unloading and pre preparation. Unfortunately, because they were coming from all over the country, all 77 semis arrived in downtown Detroit at the same time and made us the fan favorite of all the local traffic. So the first step in, in the SPMT move is how do we get these temporary abutments that are on driven pile out of the way uh, after they've been sitting in their location for a couple of years at this point? So the answer is those stabilizing carrier beams that we showed you earlier uh, came in handy also for transferring that load off of the abutments and onto the SPMTs, but how do we get them out of there? And the answer is trees, lots and lots of trees. Uh, this is African azobe wood, and it comes in the form of our very nice Django blocks here. Uh, basically using uh, climbing jacks and, and uh, tire semi loads of, of Django blocks. Uh, we built four uh, towers underneath neath each of the knuckles uh, and had a, a crew of about 40 some people uh, working to, to basically swap the blocks in and out as the bridge was uh, lifted 16 feet in the air. At that point, it uh, became t obvious to all of us that this might be the last time we ever see the sole plates and we had to weld to them. So it was time to get the uh, galvanizing off of them. Uh, this actually ended up taking an entire day worth of grinding. Uh, July 15th, here's a great picture up on, uh, at the end of that you know, day, we up, this is up from the parking garage there on the left. Uh, during the original design, uh, we talked to those heavy movers like Matt mentioned, and the estimate was somewhere between 80 and 96 lines of SPMTs uh, because we added the end diaphragms and some of the other uh, restrictions we had, we ended up using a 120 lines. So the front end was triple 12s and the back were triple eights. And then you can see them uh, fully assembled there on the left. And then on the right picture, you see them as they're moving underneath the abutments once those uh, temporary, uh, I'm sorry, underneath the uh, knuckles once the temporary abutments were removed. So on the 16th of July, we began to load those, uh, to the shoes as they call them. Those are those triangular pieces in the middle and uh, onto those, that and the carrier beams front and back. Uh, so uh, basically we just pulled the SPMTs under and on the 16th, we played Jenga in reverse. Uh, on July 18th, as our final preps for the move, uh, for the initial move, we spent that day basically getting every chain and, and binder uh, in the Metro Detroit area and going to town. Uh, and as you can see in the picture on the left, it was a lot of just stabilizing and tie downs and on the right, uh, we're going to talk about this in a second, but we had to figure out how to pick up those uh, carrier beams in the front and back of each uh, of the front knuckles, how to pick up the back ones so that they can make the transfer through the slide onto the SPMTs again uh, with the bridge. So Matt had mentioned that monitoring system around the 18th as well. We, we began to uh, put those wires in, and I will tell you, you can't see them in the picture. Neither could we on site until we tripped over them. So it's kind of a, a comedy of errors, but we got those installed, and then you'll see the little red light there. Uh, that little red light racked up more billable hours than anything else in the move uh, because every engineer on site stared at it and waited for it to flash. So July 19th, it's time for the bridge to make its initial move. For the first time, this 5.3 million pound uh, skeleton was going to take take off. Well, not take off, thank goodness, but, you know, move. And so uh, these are the pictures from that day. And uh, you can see we had a banner up there that only lasted a few minutes with the wind, but it was a very big moment, lots of people around. and. We began to move it uh, over. So its initial move was to the east and then turning 90 degrees to align with the abutment for 2nd Avenue. Uh, as we were starting that move, it was um, brought to our attention that the only thing able to get those front carrier beams out was a crane. And so we now had to accommodate the area of a crane. Well, as you can see, that wasn't going to fit in our BSA, the bridge staging area. So we had to actually back it up out of our staging area and into the uh, front lawn of Wayne State. 
And conveniently, the building we were backing it up against was the Wayne State University Law School. So if you're ever wondering where the best place to park an SPMT's power packs, it's not the lobby of a law school. We'll tell you that. So once we got it in and got her backed up, we pulled the crane in, we pulled those front carrier beams off, and then we began to transfer for the first initial slide. And so the SPMT is pulled forward. Uh, the slide system was already supported on all the jack stands you can see there. And essentially we just had to get it lined up. The, some new plates had to be put in acting like shims. We also had to add some uh, bottle jacks at the nose of the SPMTs to prepare for that load to transfer to the front of the SPMTs, leaving the back, un, you know, not really doing much. So we want to make sure we distributed the load. And so there's just a lot of connection and prep work that went into that. And of course we slid it over to the abutments. Now uh, we took the weekend off to uh, basically shut the freeway down and bring in the gravel. Once that was done, the front SPMTs that uh, had already transferred to the abutments were brought down below and 34 foot tall towers were built on each one, as you can see there in the picture on the right. And then we began the transfer. So although the big first move and the second move across the freeway is what gets everyone's attention, this was actually the trickiest part is how do we transfer from SPMT to abutment to SPMT in a slide system. And Mamut did a fantastic job. Uh, so here you can see on July 23rd, again, we got them now on those front SPMTs. And we spent the rest of that day, as you can see on the right, with running cables and chains and, and, and wires and things like that, just getting everything prepped for the actual move across I-94. And then as we know in Michigan, the weather said no clouds, no rain, perfect weather, and everything changed. And we got a pretty heavy downfall that night. And so we now have saturated aggregate on our travel path. Uh, this would have been you know, no big deal, except we needed approximately 196 uh, road plates to make the move. And we only had 72 on hand. So we ended up, and you'll see in our time-lapse video, we ended up having to do a actual hopscotch method across. Uh, here you go, you can see right there, the loader in the background moving the plates and the SPMT is moving across while the rear SPMTs are actually still up on grade. So on the 25th, we arrived at the other side and made the uh, final transfer. Uh, so the second slide, so again, it was move, slide, move, slide. Uh, what made this unique though, is that this bridge is at a skew and SPMTs do not come in the skewed model. They're all squared edges. So uh, each stroke of the jacks on the shoes actually changed the loading condition. So every time the jack would, uh, would you know, come forward about 12 inches, the one, maybe you'd have a knuckle that was on an SPMT, another knuckle that's on an abutment, one that's halfway between on a slide rail, the back end's doing the same thing. So with each stroke of the jack, the loading situation changed entirely. Uh, again, once we had it over the abutments, we had to rebuild those towers that we saw earlier out of our Azobi wood. And on July 26th, those uh, front SPMTs were pulled off and began to disassemble uh, while we began to lower the structure down. This picture here is again, we're continuing to lower uh, as we're getting closer to the back wall, we have yet one more uh, challenge to overcome, and that is that the climbing jacks, I, I apologize, I keep calling them walking jacks, but climbing jacks are taller than the uh, bearings and the pedestals underneath. So we have one more uh, method to overcome. You see here's the picture on the right where we now realize we can't just take it straight to the bearing. We have to get those climbing jacks out of there somehow. So I'd like to introduce you to Franken Jack. Uh, this was our, our solution. Those are six 200 ton bottle jacks uh, welded and chained to four foot by four foot, two and a half inch steel plates, top and bottom. And we made four sets of these. And there you can see them underneath the, uh, underneath the end diaphragm as we made that final transfer. And there on the right, you can see we have now made touchdown on our bearings on July 27th. And then on July 28th, we found these thinnest welders in the state of Michigan and stuffed them in there. I think we got them all back. So don't worry about them. They, I think they all got to go home. Uh, but we stuffed them in there and uh, began the welding process to attach the bearings to the sole plates. So we've talked about this before, but one of the keys to success and one of the things we had learned from other projects was we didn't want to have to try to call people or email each other. We wanted communication to be much quicker and much more, uh, you know, in touch with what was happening. So in this picture is not just onlookers. In there you have MDOT, HDR, Tetra Tech, h &D Parsons, Jansen, Spons, Z Tech Contractors, Mamut, uh, Bob's, which is the Bureau of Bridges and Structures from MDOT, and other uh, major decision makers. And basically, uh, there were core members of each of those groups identified. And so every time an adjustment needed to be made, a decision needed to be made, uh, we had multiple uh, hold points within the process, that group would get together, review the data, look at the, the control points of the structure, and every decision had to have full concurrence before it was advanced. And so this made a very smooth and, and honestly issue-free process uh, with everybody on site. And then the last picture I just wanted to show everyone, 
is uh, this is the uh, end diaphragm on the southern end. Uh, before it went behind the back wall, we took a moment to sign it so that 50 years from now when this bridge, somebody has to work on it or something, they'll all look at it and go, well, who are these people? So this is just a time-lapse video that you can see online at YouTube if you'd like. Uh, as you can see, here's that initial move on the 19th where we took it from its uh, temporary location, brought it over and turn it 90 degrees to uh, bring it up to the abutment and do that initial slide onto the abutments. You can see there the slide rails. There's those front carrier beams being removed. Here's bringing in the new, uh, the 34 foot tall towers as we transfer the bridge onto those. You get to see our loaders playing hopscotch across the uh, freeway. Now, once the bridge is in its location and transferred to the other abutments, obviously the time lapse doesn't really show uh, what was going on, but there's quite a flurry of activity as we're trying to lower the structure. At the same time, the contractor is bringing in their uh, earth movers or their uh, uh, excavators to take out the, the uh, gravel and just start re-putting pavement lines down, re-pouring barrier wall, uh, all the stuff to get the uh, freeway open once the bridge is considered in a safe condition, which is obviously the initial welding to the sole plates was complete. And I would just mention too, uh, I just want to watch this. So if you go to YouTube and you just search uh, Michigan Second Avenue, Detroit, you should find this. It's on MDOT's YouTube page. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to I think Mike. Yep. So, you know, in conclusion, and I think we've said it a hundred times, uh, there's there's a lot of complexities in a bridge like this. I've had a chance to work on a lot of complicated bridges around the country and and beyond. Uh, and honestly, I would say that this one is maybe uh, the most complex uh, bridge for such a small compact pack as, as I've ever seen. Um, you know, so what I think we showed with the project is that these ABC types of projects, especially for a signature bridge, I, you know, I think that can be done in the design bid build environment like we did here. But I think uh, having contractor input early, uh, officially through alternative delivery like CMGC or, or now progressive design build is starting to take hold. I think that would be fantastic, you know, as designers, then we're not having to guess or make assumptions about how the contractor would build the bridge. You know, it would be built into the recipe from the very beginning. Um, we talked a little bit about the mock-up and how important that was for that knuckle region. Uh, that was probably the best thing we did, honestly, as a design team, was make sure that that was part of the contract documents. I can't imagine how much trouble they would have had had they tried to pour the first knuckle with the real thing, with the real post-tensioning hardware, with all the epoxy coated rebar. Uh, so that was a fantastic thing. And I would definitely recommend that in the future. Uh, this independent peer review for complex bridges like this is so valuable. I can't overstate how important that was. Um, it's not about an ego thing as the designer, you know, not wanting someone to criticize your design at all. You know, it's great to have a third set of eyes looking at all of these things. Uh, I would strongly recommend that uh, everywhere. And, and we're seeing it. The last few years, that's become a growing trend in the complex bridge world. And, you know, just lastly, the collaboration between everyone, the designer, the owner, the contractor, the erection engineer, everybody that worked on the project uh, was so uh, useful and so beneficial overall. I don't think you can do a project like this without it um, and with that i guess we'll open it up to questions all right thank you mike matt and john very interesting project certainly very complex projects and like you said really a teamwork was the key at this point we are going to turn it to uh, 
Paul Lides to moderate the question and answer period. Uh, Paul, it's all yours. Yeah, Tori, we're going to let Rick uh, do the questions today because uh, uh, he's from Michigan. So anyway. All right. Rick, Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Rick, go no, ahead. You're okay. I'm going to pick up the end. All right. Yep. Thanks, Paul. Um, great presentation, guys. Um, Kind of one of the questions uh, might be, Mike might have a, a good insight on this. Uh, are there all other design examples or construction using SPMTs to move network arches like this uh, nationally or internationally? You know, there's been there's been a handful of examples where SPMTs are used uh, in conjunction a lot of times with a float in for bridges like this. Honestly, that's one of the big advantages of a tight arch bridge is the fact that, you know, once it's completely assembled, uh, it's freestanding, it's self-supporting, and so you have the ability to pick it up and move it around. Um, as far as we know, this is the first time a bridge has been moved in like this in a great separation type situation. Uh, if there are any others out there that I haven't seen, I would love to learn more about them. There's always lessons we can learn uh, from each other, I think. So if there, anyone out there knows of one, please let me know. Uh, I will say we've got another one uh, sort of similar to this in Toronto that we're working on right now as part of the Ontario Line project. Uh, that bridge is going to have to be, it's a tight arch, about 100, 400 foot span. Uh, and the plan is to build one end of the bridge and roll it in longitudinally underneath some high voltage power lines. And we're going to build the other half of the bridge and roll it into place longitudinally to meet, meet up with the first half and then bolt the two sections together. So it's sort of a, another hybrid version of ABC. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, another quick one here. Uh, was there any proprietary materials, high performance steel, concrete coatings, uh, unique? I know you mentioned it in the presentation, some of the, the bigger picture stuff, but was there anything else that uh, was maybe uh, lower, lower volume or, or whatever? I, you know, I, I, I guess I can't think of anything, Rick, that was, really truly you know unique from a material standpoint okay um were the arch ribs uh shop assembled they you know laid down on their side and made sure that they all fit up before uh they, they were, were shipped they, they, yeah the three sections were fit up on their sides and then disassembled and, and transported to the side okay you know the, um, the another... one thing with this bridge with the pre-assembly since the floor system is structural steel and the tie girders and end diaphragms are post-tension concrete, those elements never met up with each other until they were on site in Detroit. So that did add some, some challenges for the contractor. Yep. yep. Um, were there any uh, issues with driving the SPNTs uh, over any underground utilities, particularly in the freeway? Um, any, uh, you know, the only thing I remember, they, they did have a utility line up in the bridge staging area, but in right through that parking lot. But the thing with SPMTs is the, the actual ground pressure beneath the wheels is actually less than an 18 wheel semi because there are, you know, multiple hundred wheels. The individual pressure is not that high. Um, yep. hey. Mike, I can maybe also just chime in on that too, that we had a fairly uh, substantial, I want to say it was at least nine inches minimum uh, aggregate base was put down both in the staging area and over the roadway to protect the other to storm sewer or anything else that would have been in there. And that, that was designed by a geotechnical engineer. To help help yep. distribute Good the load even you. more. So, yep. yep. Okay. Uh, was there any interaction with uh, Wayne State engineering students as we were as we were doing this project? Yeah, actually, I there was. John, uh, I know John hit on the lawyer on the lawyer side of it, but what about the engineers? <laughs> Not the law school, the engineering school. Yeah, actually, there was. Uh, I, I reached out to the civil engineering department back in the middle of design and actually did a couple of different guest lectures to their bridge engineering course. I, the the professor there uh, brought a group of students out to the site to uh, multiple times actually to look around and see different things to see the bridge move. You know that parking garage was the perfect spot to be able to sit and and watch everything that was going on totally safe and out of the way. Yep. 
Yeah, there was a lot of people, uh, sidewalk um, superintendents walking around, right? So. Exactly. Western Michigan had uh, students involved too. They actually used this bridge as one of their capstone projects for, t I think, two or three different groups of seniors, John, wasn't it? Well, probably. So I'm, I'm sure there. I know we were there for, for a while, so they had plenty of opportunity to get out there and look around. So. Oh, yeah. Um, this is one of John's favorite. Uh, I know the wood. Uh, we were all impressed with the wood, but John, what's the what was the compressive strength of the uh, wood that uh, they had in those Jenga blocks you referenced? Yeah, the African Azobi wood is, uh, I believe, 17 tons per square inch. Um, and then I don't know the uh, the greener, lighter colored ones are actually a epoxy bamboo hybrid that's a little less. Um, but the uh, the Azobi is the stuff. It's an endangered species now, so uh, they only bring it out when they absolutely have to. Yep. Uh, so those were mo those were the questions that were asked uh, kind of before and at during the presentation. I guess Paul, did you have uh, any uh, any questions that you uh, came up while we're chatting here? Well, if oh, okay, go ahead. I was just gonna say one of the things on the uh, materials thing. There was no proprietary necessarily the materials used, uh, but you know some of the challenges were brought about the fact that it was 8,000 psi mass pour concrete that had to happen in a with a lot of congested steel. So uh, we ended up having to develop a concrete that was kind of a hybrid between SCC and your more traditional materials uh, to achieve the restrictions of the project on it. Okay, uh, we had a question that came in during the question and answers. This is a uh, um, One of the common issues observed with the tight arch bridges are the connection between the arch and the hangers. Did you check the fatigue of these connections? Yes, that, that was all, all checked for fatigue during design, absolutely. Okay. Um, then uh, could you tell us more about the well detail at the four corners of the trapezoidal box? Uh, is it a... a CIP well or fillet wells uh, or what? It's, it's, I'm trying uh, to think. I'd have to go back and look. It, it seems to me that it was a full pen weld on a couple of the corners. I could actually flip back to that detail if you like. Give me a second. It was, okay. It was just under a three-quarter inch fillet uh, that covered about half of the face of the of the connection point. So you would have had uh, the basically the entire front face of each sole plate to bearing uh, bearing plate connection point, and then about halfway back on each of the bearings the bear, there's three different types of bearings on the bridge so each one's slightly different but yeah that's the the gist of the weld and to open it to traffic we needed i think we calculated about three eighths of an inch of the weld to be done uh, the first few passes at least uh, to allow us to uh, uh, manage uh, thermal movement so we could open to traffic while we finish the rest hey, paul were you talking about the arch rib or the bearings um let's see uh, it, it just says the well detail at the four corners of the trapezoidal box. Oh. Yeah, so it was it was fillet welds at the bottom corners, and then it was uh, the top flange weld was was a groove weld. Actually, okay. I had to grind and groove um, because that had to be assembled afterwards after all those uh, bolted uh, hanger connection components were installed at the shop. Right. The the weld to the top flange had to be done from the outside of the box. Yep. And there was yep. a lot of discussion too about masking paint and, and things like that. So the paint didn't get it drawn. Affected the areas weld. near the weld, yeah. Okay, um, let me see if I can get one here. Um, the person had a question about the arch transverse beams. Uh, we see them during the placement of the tight arch bridge on the site. And then at the service stage, uh, did you remove these arch transverse beams uh, that serve as wind bracing or did you keep them? No, so the, so temporary bracing between the arch ribs was there during the assembly, during the move. And then once the bridge was lowered down into its final position and the deck was cast, uh, then those things could be removed. They were, and it was designed that way on purpose. Okay. Um, then. Uh, since the arches will work in compression, what did govern their dimensions? Was it the forces, moment in shear, or the instability induced by buckling? A little bit of both. I don't remember, to be honest. We, we, we certainly checked both of those conditions, but I don't remember 
I don't think the buckling was really a significant challenge for us. I think it was really more fitting the components inside was probably driving more than anything. Okay, and then you don't have any earthquake issues, do you? No. Luckily, we had everything else. <laughs> okay. Uh, a question came in here about uh, what is the total cost uh, per square foot or total cost of the bridge and cost per square foot? So the the cost of the bridge was $26 million. I see John's over there with his calculator working out the math. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you guys don't want to know. You don't want to know. <laughs> no, it 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 it's uh, at twenty six million. It was like Mike said, it was twenty six million dollars for the structure itself. Okay. So that's what it, it's about eleven hundred dollars a square foot. It's eleven hundred four dollars and fifty cents a square foot. But that's why I said nobody wants to know. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. you know, well, you know, a lot of the cost though is driven by the different types of SPMTs and all the specialized equipment. Uh, and it's a unique bridge. It's it's not going to be a hundred and fifty dollar per square foot, you know, rolled beam. Well, you got to also remember that when you're trying to deal with uh, a future alignment, that we're not hundred percent sure where it's going to be. Uh, the bridge had to basically fill the entire right away uh, to and be able to clear span that. We have no future throwaway work, no future pile driving work. Uh, we also provided the signature structure that the stakeholders wanted as an entryway to downtown Detroit. So there's a lot of there's a lot that goes into that that, that doesn't necessarily reflect itself properly in the bottom line. Okay, is the inside of the box accessible for future inspection? No, it's not. It, uh, it's it's just too small to fit a human inspector inside, and it's that's the challenge with these shorter span arch bridges is the rib is just not very big, and then when you have that internal hanger connection element. There's just not enough room for a person to crawl through. So we do have access ports at the bolted splices. And so the, the thought is a, an inspector could look with a bore scope inside. There's also enough room in those slots in the bottom flange to be able to inspect that way. That, that was uh, like a, you said a bore scope or maybe a robot or something. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, Let's see what else we got here. Here's one. Uh, it says uh, the bridge deck seems to be very wide. Did you observe exceptionally high torsional moment in the tie garter during design? If so, what special design details have been utilized? Yeah, that's that's very true, uh, and that's exactly why we had to do the deck casting after the move, and then do a second stage of post tensioning after the deck dead load was in place. That tie girder design was a real challenge for us, and especially that tapered portion right in front of the knuckle. So you go from the full size knuckle, and there's a tapered section, and then the, the transition to the more uh, rectangular tie girder. So it's, it definitely was a big challenge. An awful lot of modeling went into that. We brought in some of our post tensioning experts from the West Coast that helped us out a lot in looking at that issue. Okay, um, at what level of plan development were the peer reviews conducted? So the peer review really didn't start until relatively late in the design. And I'm gonna say it was, what, 70 or 80% design probably when that started, I don't recall exactly. Um, it, was, it was in light of a couple of things that had happened in the industry that really increased the focus on the peer review for complex bridges, uh, it really was a great addition. Uh, when we got Parsons on board, they created their own model of the, of the design phase as well as throughout the construction. That was one of the best things that was done in the end to benefit the project. And I hope we see that all the time going forward. Okay, uh, we got another question here. Uh... The tie beams here are consisting of uh, pre-stressed concrete sections or maybe post-tension, but he said, why did you opt for concrete instead of steel beams? Honestly, that was the one of the first conversations we had at the kickoff meeting at the beginning of design. So the state bridge engineer from Michigan at that time, Matt Chenoweth, uh, was very adamant about, he wanted that tiger to be absolutely redundant 
uh, to be uh, repairable in the future if it was ever impacted by an overheight vehicle. So it was, uh, I mean, that was basically directed to us from day one is, is make sure that that thing could be repairable in the future. Uh, we really like the idea of the post-tension tie girder because you do have 12 strands and 12, 19 strand tendons. Um, so even if you lost a couple of those to an overheight vehicle, you still have more than enough capacity to keep the bridge open. Uh, you might have to shift traffic a little bit. Um, you know, honestly, the way the bridge is designed, the tie girder is, is really not a flexural member at all. It really, uh, all the loads at the end of the floor beam are picked up by the hangers, right where the steel floor beam bolts to the inside face of the tie girder. So the tie is truly just an axial force member that provides a stiffening, uh, primarily in, in torsion for the floor beams. Uh, Paul, just, just said we have a very bad storm coming through. Just in case that you lose FIU, uh, Mary looks for takeover. Okay. okay. Thanks, Doran. And, and one other thing that, uh, Mike, don't forget, we uh, we actually, uh, the design team added a nosing, a sacrificial nosing to the face yeah. of the tiger girders for that same purpose. If it's ever struck, uh, hopefully we can, you know, prevent damage to the tiger girder and just replace the nosing. And that was added uh, after the move. Yep. Okay, that was in the plans all along, is that right? It yep. was, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was actually added after the second stage of post-tensioning. So now we don't need none of it's not pre-compressed at all, so that nosing can be repaired anytime. Okay. Uh that's all the questions that we have at this time. Uh so I think uh we'll turn it back over to a torrid. All right. We thank you, Mike, Matt, John. Very, very interesting projects. And thank you, Paul, for moderating the question and answer period. Uh, so on that note, we are going to conclude the webinar and hope to see everyone back with us for the next monthly webinar. Thank you.